Looking now at the smallest of the big four companies, the Southern Railway differed from its rivals by virtue of the fact that its income was based more on its passenger services rather than its freight conveyance, and had been created through the amalgamation of the London and South Western Railway and the London Brighton and South Coast Railway in the South West, and the South Eastern Railway and the London Chatham and Dover Railway, which operated via the South Eastern and Chatham Railways Company's Joint Management Committee in the South East. From these various railways, the Southern inherited a vast system that spread across the entire south coast of England, from Padstow in the west to Ramsgate in the east, with the London and South Western Railway having previously been the mainline operator of services from London Waterloo to Portsmouth, Bournemouth, Southampton, Weymouth, Salisbury, Exeter, Plymouth, Ilfracombe, Barnstable and Padstow, in competition with the Great Western, while the London Brighton and South Coast Railway ran services from London Victoria and London Bridge to Brighton, Portsmouth, Eastbourne, New Haven, and along the Sussex coast, and the South Eastern and Chatham Railways Company's Joint Management Committee, which incorporated both the South Eastern Railway and London Chatham and Dover Railway, ran trains from London Victoria, Charing Cross and Cannon Street, to destinations in Sussex and Kent, including the channel ports of Dover and Folkestone, as well as providing a cross-country service to Reading, the Southern breaking up the former network of its progenitors into three operational districts, the Western, the Central, and the Eastern, each of which were designated along generally the same lines as the previous four railway companies, so as to reduce the potential for internal rivalries, with locomotives and staff remaining generally within their original territories. As mentioned, the Southern Railway was by far the smallest of the Big Four, encompassing only 2,186 route miles upon its formation in 1923. Although despite its size, the railway sported perhaps the greatest number of notable and innovative assets, possessing the largest and busiest station in the UK with London Waterloo, providing the highest number of scheduled services per day with a track usage that was far greater than any of its contemporaries. It owned the largest passenger port facility in Britain at Southampton Docks, as well as operating cross-channel ferry facilities at Dover and Folkestone, and, upon its creation, also operated 75 miles of electric suburban railway the most extensive suburban electric train system in the world at the time, while due to its ability to effectively serve the south of England, including the major conurbations of Portsmouth, Southampton, Brighton, Basingstoke and Winchester, it also possessed the highest season tific traffic for commuters when established, creating perhaps the UK's very first high-intensity long-distance commuter corridors outside of London's extensive suburban railways. In terms of traffic, 75% of the company's earnings came from the passenger market, presenting the highest proportion of passengers carried as per the total business of a railway company in the world. Its route mileage, while only comprising one-eighth of the entire British mainline network, carrying over a quarter of all passengers on UK trains, doubling the number carried by the Great Western Railway with only half its route mileage, while only beaten in terms of volume by the London Midland and Scottish Railway, but this is only due to the fact that the LMS covered a far wider area of the UK network and served many major cities including Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool and Glasgow. The Southern also boasting more terminus stations in central London than its rivals, with Waterloo, Victoria, Charing Cross, Blackfriars and Cannon Street to call its own, the latter two being ideally situated to serve the financial district of the historic city of London, while beyond the capital, other lines absorbed in 1923 included the Plymouth, Devonport and Southwestern Junction Railway, the miniature Linton and Barnstable Railway, and the two individual rail companies of the Isle of Wight the Isle of Wight Central, and the Freshwater Yarmouth and Newport Railway, amalgamating, in total, five constituent companies and 14 subsidiary companies, the last of which was not fully absorbed until 1924. With undisputed control over the operations of railways to the south coast of England, the Southern ran a near-perfect monopoly on train provision to many vital destinations, its only competition being in the far west with the Great Western where it did battle for the lucrative summer holiday traffic to the seaside resort towns of Devon and Cornwall, served by its extensive branch west of Exeter to Ilfracombe, Bodmin and Padstow, while in terms of joint operations, the southern shared operation of the Somerset and Dorset joint railway between Bath and Bournemouth with the LMS, though truly the highlight of the southern was its early adoption of electric traction as a means of speeding up the high-frequency commuter services between London and the southern counties, ultimately leading to the creation of the world's first fully electric intercity railway with the electrification of the London Victoria to Brighton main line with third rail operation. But even beyond its lucrative suburban offerings, the Southern hosted numerous lavish named trains that were spread across its vast network, including such iconic services as the Bournemouth Bell, the Atlantic Coast Express, the Devon Bell, and its two continental trains dedicated to serving the cross-channel ferry market, the daytime Golden Arrow and the night ferry, which itself saw overnight sleeping cars transferred via the Dover to Dunkirk train ferry for onward running to Paris and Brussels.
although perhaps the most famous of the Southern's named trains, was the Brighton Bell of 1933, which was operated by a specially built series of chocolate and cream liveried five-car electric multiple units dubbed the Five Bell, and were capable of whisking passengers at 75 miles an hour in comfort and luxury, the 70-mile distance from London to Brighton in one hour exactly. Also taken over by the Southern was the extensive port facilities of Southampton Docks, which had been procured in 1892 by the London and South Western Railway due to its financial strength over the existing Southampton Dock Company, the investment of the railway helping to turn what was an overwhelmed harbour facility into the largest and busiest ocean liner port in the UK, famous for being the arrival and departure point for such iconic vessels as the RMS Aquitania, the RMS Queen Mary, the RMS Olympic, and her doomed sister ship, the RMS Titanic. The association of the Southern Railway and its role in providing boat trains to connect with liners at Southampton Dock, which itself was served by the dedicated Southampton Terminus Station, leading to London Waterloo becoming the largest and busiest train station in the UK, hosting 21 terminal platform roads and two other tracks, while occupying an area of 24.5 acres and serving 1,560 trains every weekday. The busy nature of the Southern Railway, however, was both a blessing and a curse, as in terms of congestion, while this wasn't unique to the Southern, the sheer volume of trains operating from its various London terminals made for slow going on an average journey into the capital, with other causes as to the Southern's somewhat ponderous nature when compared to the high-speed expresses of the Great Western, LMS and LNER, being that, with the exception of the South Western main line to Basingstoke and Southampton, the Southern was a system composed primarily of short lines that were winding in nature and did not allow for long stretches of fast running, while the primary main line from London to Dover was the steepest trunk railway route out of the capital, which, in combination with its meandering course, meant even the non-stop boat trains struggled to gather significant pace, this being most evident at the Dover end of the route, where trains climbing from the Marine Station, located directly on the dockside, had to climb an arduous 1 in 105 gradient on the way up from sea level, before facing an even worse 1 in 132 climb to reach the summit at Shepherd's Well. While on the line from Canterbury to Selling, a 5-mile incline of 1 in 132 severely taxed the performance of even the most powerful steam engines, and worse still was the 1 in 75 incline from Ramsgate to Broadstairs that could only be conquered with the help of banking engines. In that, the Southern Railway was often considered the proving ground for both locomotives and engine drivers, as within its small network it was able to encapsulate some of the steepest and most winding railways in the country, with gradients ranging on average from between 1 in 80 to 1 in 100 while the absolute worst was the climb out of Exeter St. David's Station in Devon to Exeter Central, which stood at a staggering 1 in 37 and often required the assistance of up to four banking engines to help heavy express trains up this torturous incline. Though in response to these topographic obstacles, the Southern employed the services of among the most talented railway engineers and locomotive designers to help overcome the task, including William Adams, Dougal Drummond, and R. W. Urey of the LSWR, James Cudworth, James Stirling, and William Kirtley of the South Eastern and Chatham, and William Stroudley and D. Earl Marsh of the London, Brighton and South Coast, while Chief Mechanical Engineer Richard Maunsell worked tirelessly to ensure that the Southern adopted a standardised fleet of locomotives at the first opportunity, each of the designers developing such formidable machines as the N15 King Arthur 460s, the V-Class, also known as the Schools Class, and, most famous of all, the LN or Lord Nelson 460s which were at one point the most powerful 460 locomotives in service on the British network when they were introduced in 1926, setting the pace for other railways in building equivalent power, such as the Great Western's King class. Furthermore, the Southern inherited from 1923 the largest electrified mainline network in the world that comprised 75 miles of energised track, although 24 and a half of this was made up of the London, Brighton and South Coast 6.7 kV overhead electrics. The Southern capitalising on this superbly efficient new form of traction by expanding the system to double its size by 1926, while from the same year setting the standard electrification practice to 660 volt DC third rail. Continued extensions of the third rail system, seeing 277 miles of electrified network operational by 1929, eventually reaching Eastbourne, Portsmouth, Guildford, Reading and Maidstone by the middle of the 1930s, creating the world's first electrified intercity mainline network ultimately equating to 1,147 miles of energised railway. While in order to alleviate the issues of congestion, innovative infrastructural improvements were also adopted, including the replacement of troublesome at-grade junctions with flyovers and underpasses, and the general atmosphere of the Southern was refreshed as per the Art Deco trend of the period, with stations such as Surbiton, Richmond, Woking, Margate, Templecombe and Wimbledon all being rebuilt to have a cleaner and more modern aesthetic 
that did not sacrifice on practicality. With the Southern essentially running the world's largest rapid transit system, efficient scheduling of services was paramount in order to ensure that as fewer conflicts existed between the high-speed electric commuter trains and long-distance steam-hauled services, thus leading to the introduction of a clock-faced timetable for many of its trains so that they departed at the same time past each hour to help passengers easily remember the times, while also adopting a highly effective public relations department that truly made this comparatively small system stand out among its rivals, including eye-catching publicity campaigns and enhanced communications with both customers and the media of the time, the Southern being synonymous with both high-density but efficient commuter travel, but also as the gateway to the resorts of Dorset, Hampshire, Devon and Cornwall during the summer months, maintaining a healthy profit even during the dark days of the Great Depression. While the Great Western took a substantial but non-fatal financial hit, and the LMS and LNER faced the prospect of bankruptcy as their demand for freight traffic collapsed. As had been spearheaded by Maunzel during his tenure as chief mechanical engineer, further innovation could be found under the auspices of his replacement, Oliver Bulliard, from 1937, who had previously been assistant to Sir Nigel Gresley at the LNER. His first steam locomotives, released following the declaration of World War II in 1939, being the small fleet of 30 air-smooth Merchant Navy-class Pacifics during 1941 for use on the top-line high-speed boat trains to the channel ports, which included a partially welded boiler and firebox, chain-operated valve gear immersed in an oil bath, and his characteristic bullied Firth Brown cast-disc wheels that gave excellent tyre support and, combined with the setup of the valve gear, did not require balance weight so as to alleviate the hammer blow effect on the track work, these being followed in 1942 by the powerful and unusual-looking Q10060 freight engines, and in 1945, a lighter weight variant of the Merchant Navies, dubbed the West Country and Battle of Britain class Pacifics, that had been developed due to the weight of the Merchant Navies exceeding the limits of the rural main lines and branch lines to Devon and Cornwall, of which 110 examples would eventually be built. While Bulliard was also able to introduce a novel design for his coaching stock by increasing the length of the body shell to 63 foot 6 inches, with its sleek continuous curved profile, spacious open seating sections, and traditional compartments, their superb mixture of style and function being later adopted by the British Railway's Mark I coach of the 1950s. Bulliard's innovation didn't just extend to steam traction, but also to EMUs as well as experimental electric and diesel locomotives, including new multiple units in the form of the unusual double-deck 4DD units that attempted to adopt a bi-level seating arrangement that was confined to the limited clearance of the British Railway network. While his locomotive classes included two mainline electric co-co units in 1941 and 1945, initially numbered CC1 and CC2, before being renumbered to 20001 and 20002 under British Railways, and joined by a third prototype numbered 20003 in 1948, a prototype diesel engine also appearing in 1949 as the Wong Coco-1, which came to a total build-out of three examples and utilised a bolsterless bogey design that would later be incorporated into future diesel engine ranges such as the Class 44, 45 and 46 Peaks although his final steam locomotive endeavour for the Southern Railway was unfortunately not the greatest of successes, and came to pass as the strangely styled leader, which attempted to marry the power of a contemporary steam engine with the practical two-cab body shell of a diesel locomotive, while driving two six-wheel power bogies that each contained three cylinders, essentially making the unit look, externally, like a steam-powered diesel locomotive. Though due to indifference to the performance of the engine by the British Railway's management, combined with Bulliard having left the company to join the ranks of the Irish State Railways, meant the project was scrapped in 1951. Throughout World War II, the Southern, despite sitting in the front line of German aerial bombardments, maintained a working profit all the way through the conflict, and regardless of the damage incurred by air raids, continued to play a vital part in the Dunkirk evacuations of 1940, as well as supplying the build-up of troops in preparation for the D-Day landings of 1944. Though despite its comparatively successful escape from the war, the system had essentially been nationalised in 1939 under the railway executive, when it requisitioned all of the big four companies for use in assisting the war effort, a nationalisation that would remain permanent under the policies of Prime Minister Clement Attlee, this decision being formalised under the 1947 Transport Act that merged the assets of the former Southern Railway into the newly established British Railways, effective January 1st, 1948. BR inheriting from the Southern, 2,186 route miles of track, 1,919 locomotives, 6,647 coaches, 33,584 wagons, 2,054 electric vehicles, 10 hotels, 2 bus companies, 8 dockyards including Southampton, New Haven and Folkestone, 36 cross-channel and Channel Island ferries, and 40,000 employees.
Under nationalization, the former Southern Railway was transformed into the southern region of British Railways, although the western, central and eastern divisions of the company were largely maintained by BR so as to provide easy management of the former South West, South Central and South Eastern main lines as per the 1923 grouping. Many ambitious schemes for the Southern Railway, as halted by the outbreak of World War II, being delivered by British Railways during the 1950s and 60s, including electrification of the Kent Main Line to Dover and the Southwestern Main Line to Bournemouth, allowing for long-distance electric traction to replace steam on all fronts until the very last steam-hauled expresses were retired in 1967, the southern region being perhaps the most standardised of BR's geographical region system, as it utilised a design philosophy of body shells and designs that largely mimicked each other for both diesel and electric traction. The famous narrow-body Hastings units and Class 205 thumpers, used on the non-electrified lines of Kent and Hampshire, having an aesthetic very similar to the four VEP, four CIG, and four Rep Electric units of mainline services to Kent, Brighton and Hampshire, while Class 71 electrics, together with Class 73 electro-diesels and Class 33 diesels, provided locomotive haulage for the few surviving named trains that lasted into the 1960s and 70s. Although as the southern region devoted itself more to the role of a functional suburban network, and with air travel rapidly eating away the cross-channel passenger market, trains such as the Golden Arrow, the Night Ferry, the Brighton Bell, the Bournemouth Bell, and the Atlantic Coast Express were rendered extinct by the turn of the 1980s, while the withered arm route to destinations on the Devon and Cornwall coast were axed as car and bus travel stepped in to steal away the once thriving summer resort traffic. Eventually, modernisation and investment during the 1980s and 90s, as pushed by the Network Southeast sector of British Rail, meant electrification could be expanded further to destinations such as Weymouth, as complemented by the stylish and fast Wessex Electrics units that began to appear on top expresses out of London Waterloo, privatisation and the commitments of the newly formed franchises, ensuring that the archaic slam door stock of the 1950s and 60s would be replaced en masse by a new generation of electric multiple units, most prominently the Siemens to Zero sets of the Southwestern service out of Waterloo, while Southern and Southeastern operations became largely the domain of Bombardier Electrostar train sets, with new generations of diesel multiple unit, including the Class 159 and Class 171 Turbo Star sets, helping to see off the last loco hall diagrams on the few non-electrified sections that remain across this vast network, the modern-day southern region being generally a pattern of conformity that comprises multiple units serving both the long-distance and suburban markets at high-frequency intervals, maintaining the mantra of the original southern railway by playing to its strengths and tailoring its operations to meet the demands of one of the largest commuter catchments in the world, carrying millions of passengers per day in electric-powered speed and efficiency.